really windy out there. It's very difficult to find a dandelion clock. We're going to do uh, an activity with an... I am. You might not have one, but I'm going to show you a good activity and then you can recreate it at home. Okay, later. Right. Huh. I've got all my dandelion bits. Welcome! I am Lara. It's Theatre of Science. This is the show where I just tell you all about a thing I learned this week and maybe we do some activities and then there's a Lego story time show. So this week it's dandelions. We have done a daffodil dissection. You know daffodils like the fancy trumpet flowers. We, people are always pulling those apart for science because it's really easy to see the bits. But honestly, daffodils, they, it makes people feel good to look at them. Apart from that, almost useless. They're just They've hardly got any nectar, so bees aren't interested in them. Butterflies, you'll never see a butterfly hovering around a daffodil. Dandelions, these guys, they're so useful. Like, they're, yeah, they've got nectar, they've got pollen, they're really good for pollinators. The only reason we think of them is, as a weed is that they're really, really good at spreading their seeds around, so they're everywhere. So people think that they make gardens look messy. It's, it's ridiculous. They're an amazing plant. We're gonna dig right into them right now. So, first of all, I've got, I've got seven different stages of dandelion lined up for you. Okay, let's make it eight. Eight different stages of dandelion. Have a look at this. Can you put them in order? Decide which order they go in. You ready? Do, 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 do. What do you think? I should have labelled them, shouldn't I? This is one, two, three, four, mm, five. Interesting. Six, seven, eight. What order do those dandelions go in? Go on, I'll give you ten seconds. Which one's first? Which one's last? You know what order means, don't you? Go on. Eight seconds now. I'm saying order. I mean, you know what I mean. Time order from how it grows to how it dies. You ready? You done it? Mm. Right. Did you have the first one being this little thing? This is the bud. Let's talk about the bud. So the bud is covered with green, right? You've got green up here protecting the flower and you've got green down there. Those green things are called bracts. 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 I can't say it. I, I've written it on my notes. Look. Bracts. That's what I mean. Um, some of them are pointing upwards and they are protecting the flower and they last right away until, look, even when the flower's out, those bracts are protecting it. But there's some bracts down here. Right, flipping you around. <laughs> what are those bracts doing? Any idea? This is my least favourite word to say. Does anyone know what these little bracts, bracts, pointing downwards are doing? What are they for? What do you reckon? Hmm? These ones sticking upwards will be with the flower as it opens. Um, these ones are they're to protect it from insects. Isn't that clever? You know, like people put uh, things on bird feeders to stop squir squirrels climbing up and getting the nuts. It's the same sort of thing. The dandelions thought of it already. See, so those little bracts pointing down so like ants that get up can't eat the flower. I don't know, it's not the ant show. So this is a bud. And then that bud opens up to reveal what I thought was the dandelion flower. Turns out, no. Did you not know this already? That is not a dandelion flower. I know. So to explain further, first of all, we, I don't want to go too long into this, but we need to quickly look at the different bits of a flower. We're only going to really look at two different buds. Right, I printed it off. Um, so you've got, this is like a very basic big flower. You've got a big bit in the middle sticking up and that is called the stigma and that's the female bit. So a pollen uh, grain is kind of the male bit. So pollen like floats through the air from another flower it gets onto the sticky stigma, the female bit of the flower, and the pollen, this is very basic, sort of goes down the stigma to the ovary where the eggs are, right? Or the ov ovules, just a posh word for egg. So you've got the ovary with the eggs in, the pollen, the male bit, comes along, gets to the female stigma, goes down the stigma, and then pollen and egg get together, make a seed, and that seed can go on to grow other dandelions, right? Uh, here's a posher picture. I didn't want to confuse us with words. We don't really need all these words. But this is generally when you dissect a flower, what you are looking for. So, yeah, this, the, the flower is not a flower. It's actually loads and loads and loads and loads and loads of tiny little individual flowers all put together. One flower is called a floret, which is a much nicer way, it's a word than bract. So if you've got a dandelion flower with you, 
or what you thought was a flower. Can you just pull it open and let's have a look at and see if you can get, you would think it's a petal, it's not actually a petal, but if you gently pull on a petal, hopefully you'll end up with one, uh, with one floret. I'll put it down here and show you in close up. Oh, they're so cute. Okay, here we go. Behold my dandelion floret. So I've just pulled apart this flower. So we've gone, what order are we going in? We've gone bud, we've done that. The bud has opened into a flower. That was next. Oh, in fact, I had a half open one, didn't I? That's the bud opening, so that'll go next. Well done if you got that. And then we've got the flower that I've pulled apart so that we can see inside it, right? So there's all the little, they're actually ovaries. It looks like they are the individual eggs, but they're not. So if we look at one floret here, that's the ovary, that tiny little bit there, which has got, I think, more than one seed inside it. And then this bit sticking up is the stigma. You see, there's absolutely loads of them. And they've all got these little hooks on the end. So each one of those is a stigma on a separate flower. The petal bit isn't called a petal bit. It's called a check's notes ligule. Where have it, where's it gone? There we go. That's the ligule. That's the stigma, the female bit. So the pollen grain goes onto that. Down, 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 down. Gets to the ovary. And then that male pollen meets the female egg in there. And a seed is made. And you know what this little fluffy bit is, don't you? See that tiny little fluffy bit? So that's one dandelion flower. How weird is that? Uh, that one little fluffy bit, yeah, it's the little parachute thing that ends up attached to the seed on the dandelion clock. It's all starting to come together. Right, so it, so it opens up um, and then it starts to close again. So, so the, the flower opens so the bees can get their furry little bodies and their legs all over the flower as they try and find the delicious sweet nectar. And as they're drinking the nectar, they get loads of pollen all over their bodies. And then they fly to another dandelion to get the nectar from that dandelion and they rub the pollen all over the stigma. So when the dandelion flower has had some pollen mixed with its egg to make a seed, yeah, it closes up again. So that's the next one. Wait, yeah, I'm gonna say that's the next one. So you can see that flower's just started to close up that is a flower that is closed. And eventually the petals, because they've done their job, they've attracted the bees, the flower is pollinated, the seed is growing, those petals just fall off. So this sort of manky one was <laughs> next. Eventually, have you ever done this? I always used to find this so satisfying when I was a kid, just pulling the, yeah. <laughs> eventually all those petals will just disappear. Um, and it's the little um, parachute things, the it's called the papas, that little white parachute. It's it's time to shine. So this was the last one, and eventually that opens up again into a dandelion clock. And then the seeds are ready to be blown away. We could do a whole show just on, on this bit, really. The seeds can travel up to 60 miles, right? Um, and dandelions can actually clone themselves as well. I didn't know this. So, so there's loads of seeds here, obviously. One dandelion in a field is enough to, for the next year, the whole field to be full of dandelions. Like just one dandelion can do that. And the next year, obviously, you got millions and millions of seeds. So this is why people don't like them, because they're just really good at what they do. All right, so let's, oh yeah, let's do this activity then with this, uh, with this dandelion clock while I've got it here. So I have, to my shame, I have written about this activity in one of my support magazines, people who support me, a little plug, uh, get sent to Theatre Science magazine every so often, and one of them was on seeds, and I said, if you dip a dandelion clock upside down in a glass of water, then you can pull it out again and it'll look exactly the same. And the science of why that happens is, is quite often explained incorrectly on the internet, but I've never actually done it. I'm lying to you, I did it this morning on Facebook, but until today, I hadn't ever done it. So have a look at this, right? A uh, glass of water, I've got, here we go. Here's the dandelion clock. You ready? It's just a minute. This is story time, sorry, which we're going to do later. So, dandelion clock goes into the glass of water. Let's have a look. This is a better dandelion clock than the one I use on Facebook. So look at that. That is just beautiful, isn't it? Isn't that amazing? Wow. And then when I pull it out, you ready? Uh, whoa! Come on! Ah, oh, that's got to be one of the best things we've ever done on Theo Science. So I said you won't all have dandelion clocks, but I've, 
I, uh, I thought I'd show you it so you can do it later. Let's try again. Let's try again. Hope I'm not pushing my luck here. Goes in. Comes out. Wow. So the explanation. Oh, wait. Oh, okay. You just stay there, matey. We'll need you in a sec. The explanation for that on the internet is quite often dandelions are waterproof. Um, it is not that dandelions are waterproof. I'm going to use written me to explain it because written me is just better and more thought through than talking me. You ready? Uh, are dandelion clocks waterproof? No, they mix well with water. When dunked, each tiny parachute, that's a little papas, yeah? Each tiny parachute closes and captures a water droplet. Then all the closed parachutes make contact, trapping air in the centre so water can't get in. So if you, I've written here, dunk the dandelion again and give it a squeeze while it's underwater, you should see the air bubble escape. So they actually love water, the little papas, papases, papai, I don't know. Um, they get the water droplet, they all come together to trap air, and it's that air bubble that kind of protects the clock. So I thought, well, we'd, we'd better do that again. And, uh, and squeeze it and just prove to ourselves that that is what's happening. See the air coming out. So you ready? Go in here. Oh, so cool. Trap the air. Will I see air come out? Oh, yeah, look at that. Air bubbles escaping. Good, good, good. Right. Well done. Written me, Theatre of Science magazine. Available now in no shops. I'll tell you how you get it later. Okay, so... Now we've got the little brown seeds. Um, apparently they are kind of slightly rough so that it's easier for them to stick into the ground when they land. Um, let's talk a little bit about the other bits that we've missed out. We've talked about, we need to talk about the leaves. We need to talk about uh, the roots and the white sticky stuff and then we'll do story time. So um, the, the leaves of a dandelion plant are incredibly good for you. This is the other major bombshell that I realized about dandelions. Don't you do this. Just watch what I'm doing. Don't actually do it. Every single bit of the plant. <laughs> it, oh, no. <laughs> Every single bit of the plant is edible. Not necessarily going to enjoy it, but it won't kill you. It's incredibly good for you. The leaves have got a lot of calcium in. That's why I like snails. A lot of mammals eat them. Ungulates, you know, like the cows and things and the sheep. Um, they've got a lot of vitamin C in. They've got a lot of vitamin K in. I'm being unfair. A lot of people actually who were commenting on Facebook were saying that they use a lot of recipes for like dandelion wine, dandelion tea, dandelion coffee. Find a recipe and do it. It's like you wouldn't eat a parsnip, you know. It's the younger flowers and, and things that are good for you. But you can eat every part of it. The root, the leaves, the flower. Um, how dandelions get their name is in French, they are called Don de Lyon because en français, Don means teeth, and lion means lion, and French thought that it looked like the leaves looked like lion's teeth. I was like, really, really, French people in the past? Uh, I don't know. I don't know. I have a picture of some lion's teeth here, so you can decide for yourself. Well, sorry, that was a bit of a terrifying close-up, wasn't it? Am I still? Oh yeah, I'm still zoomed in. Oops. <laughs> what do you reckon? Don de Lyon, teeth of the lion. Here's a better one. Are you? I don't know, I guess, yeah, I'm going to give them that. Fair enough. So, yeah, the French called it Don de Lyon, and then we in the UK called it Dandelion, if it sounds similar. Um, they're also in French called Pisson Lit, uh, which means we the bed, because they are a diuretic. They um, have got something in them that, that does make you do a lot of wheeze. Right, that's the leaf. The root of dandelions is amazing. Have you ever tried to dig up a dandelion? Um, Again, um, gardeners complain about dandelions. The root is actually quite useful because it goes deep into the ground and it kind of loosens up all the soil, which allows other plants to grow. It's called a tap root, the root of a dandelion. Look at that. It can get, this is the longest one I can find, it can get two, four and a half metres long. Four and a half metres long! Four and a half metres! Imagine that! You can't! It's like much, much higher than your ceiling, probably, if you're living in a semi like me. Um, it's called a taproot because that's what it's doing. It's tapping into the soil. So um, plants with taproots are very good at surviving very dry conditions because there's more water further down. Um, so they send out one big long root. It doesn't have to be this shape. So like a carrot is a taproot. A parsnip 
is a taproot, um, but a radish or a beetroot, that's also a taproot, you know, like it's got one bulky bit, but then it has got a very, very thin, long taproot. Um, so yeah, they're just brilliant, aren't they? And again, the roots are edible. I ate the top of one of these the, and it was this morning and it was the worst thing I've ever done in my life. I'm gonna eat the bottom and see if that's any sweeter. No, 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 oh, no, it's not. I mean, you wouldn't get more parsnip, so, you know, it's my bad. I'm sure they're delicious when they're roasted. Ugh. Um, you can't eat them unless you've got an adult with you because, unfortunately, humans are super bad at spraying things. Like, we spray all weed killer all over the place. So I've got these ones that I'm not eating because they're from my local park and I can't guarantee they haven't been sprayed with uh, pesticide or weed killer, which is incredibly bad for you, not nutritious at all. These ones are from my garden, so I know I can eat these because, um, yeah, I haven't sprayed anything on them. Oh, so much regret. Okay, just before we move on. Oh, man, alive. Whew. There's obviously, if you've picked a dandelion, which I'm sure you have before, you'll find there's this uh, like milky white stuff in them that's called latex it um it's like it's got something in it which makes beetles not eat them basically um and yeah it is latex you know like latex gloves so it's like a natural form of latex so some people with a latex allergy it probably wouldn't be a problem but you might want to just be careful if you're handling uh, dandelions um i need to talk about this thing called fascination which i had never heard of until laurie's adult got in touch and said you should talk about dandelion fascination so the tip of a plant is called the merry stem and the merry stem has cells in it that could turn into any other kind of cell, right? So the, the merry stem could turn into the petals or it could turn into the leaves or whatever. Fascination is when something unusual happens to that merry stem, like something changes in it. It could be maybe it gets a bacterial infection or a virus or some frost or it could be some sort of hormone imbalance, but anyway, Fascination is when something's up with the merry stem and it does interesting things. Look, I don't know what kind of flower this is, but this one is fascinated. Isn't that amazing? Here's a fascinated dandelion. So usually you only get one dandelion per stem, but here there's two or possibly even three because it's fascinated. I know, right? And it is. Um, the other thing, oops, that's story time. The other thing, there's another activity for you just before we go to story time, good grief. Mm. Oh, that's the seed water. This is it's a good job that all parts of dandelion are edible. Um, gravitropism. Gravitropism is when plants grow sort of because of gravity. Like they can kind of detect gravity. Like have you ever wondered why the roots of a plant always go downwards? They never end up sticking up into the air. Like how does a plant know? It's gravitropism. <clears throat> I'm using the word sense like they've got brains, but you know what I mean? Like they can detect gravity and the roots grow downwards. Dandelions have got this kind of gravitropism where they grow upwards. So the stem detects gravity and grows upwards. And you can do this activity, the internet told me, where you get a dandelion that is sort of still a bud or a very small flower. You chop the bud off, you put it in water and you turn it sideways and it will like overnight, it will turn up, it'll start to go upwards. It's not the same as like uh, sunflowers following the sun. It doesn't have anything to do with the sun, it's just detecting gravity. And ha but obviously it's quite hard to get a dandelion, keep it wet and have it sideways. So what this internet said was, what this whole internet said, was that you should get a pipette, like a plastic pipette, chop the top off, put the dandelion in with some water and then seal it with blue tack, but I was like, my lot aren't going to have pipettes just lying around. And if they were, they wouldn't want to chop up something that was plastic and make it like so that you couldn't reuse the plastic thing. I thought, how, how do I keep a dandelion wet and have it sideways and no water spills? And ideally, it'd be using something that most people will have in their homes. Folks, I've done it. You ready? And I left it overnight and sure enough, Look at that! <laughs> you are the only people who will be impressed with me for this. Look, I got a bottle of wine. Um, I, you can ask someone if you don't have one. And I just cut a slice out of the cork and then put the cork in the bottle full of water and then slotted the dandelion in. So last night, this dandelion stem, I swear, 
It was sideways. And then I came downstairs. I did hold, I did balance it over the sink just in case it leaked. I came downstairs this morning and it was sticking upwards like that. Isn't that brilliant? So you can do that yourselves. So I'll zoom in so you can see what I did. Right, people, we are gonna break the internet with this. I need to, I need to make some sort of TikTok out of this, right? There you go, I just cut a chunk out of a cork, slotted that in, and uh, yeah, there you go. You're welcome, that's your weekend sorted, isn't it? <laughs> right, it's definitely time for story time. Uh, yeah, it just is, it is. Um, is it all set up? Is it all set up? Yeah, it's looking great, it's looking great. Get rid of my slightly soggy dandelions. Come with me. Story time this week is set in the early 1700s. Here's Hans Sloan. He loved botany. He studied it in London and in France became a very successful doctor, treating members of the royal family, had a real passion, came up with loads of brilliant uses for plants. Um, he traveled all over the world and amassed a huge collection of stuff, plants, other living things, some non-living things. Um, he was a great, oops, sorry. Not, he was a great supporter of the Chelsea Physic Garden, a beautiful patch of green in London where all kinds of interesting plants were and still are grown. This is Elizabeth Blackwell. She loved botany. She studied it in London and Paris at, wait, sorry, wait, no, sorry, um, uh, no, it's the 1700s. She's a, uh, yeah, no, sorry, my notes are wrong. Um, 1700s okay elizabeth this is elizabeth blackwell she loved botany she married her second cousin <laughs> let's be polite and say her second cousin sounds like a massive unsuccessful person and um, he worked as a doctor in their hometown of aberdeen in scotland uh, but then he had to stop doing that. There was some sort of problem relating to him, like not really being trained as a doctor. Uh, so they both had to run away to London where husband ended up working as a printer. Uh, but this made all the printers in London angry because he wasn't really qualified to be a printer. So they reported him to the authorities. So his printing shop got taken away. So he got into massive amounts of debt and couldn't pay his debts. So eventually got put in prison. So Elizabeth Backwell, she's in London. She, her husband's in jail. She has a child to support, by the way. Hmm, what's she going to do? Well, she had studied painting as a child and she was very good at that. Um, and she was obviously quite a good businesswoman because she spotted an opportunity. So in London at this time, uh, in the physics garden, there were lots of plants that were used for medicine. People in the 1700s used all kinds of different plants for medicine, but there wasn't a book around that explained what plants were used for medicine that also had pictures. This might not seem like a money-making opportunity now, but don't forget there's no internet around, right? So if you want to know what a plant is, you, you've got to have a book on it. And who wants a book on flowers that doesn't have any pictures? Nobody. Okay, so Elizabeth Blackwell was like, I know, I'll write that book, I'll draw the pictures, and everyone will love it, and I'll get enough money to get my husband out of prison. A lot of descriptions of Elizabeth Blackwell talk about how great she was to her husband. Doesn't seem like the best use of money to me, but there you go. Um, not everyone thought that women studying plants was okay. So plants have male bits and female bits that get together to make baby plants, and some people thought it was not right for ladies to be seeing that sort of thing. The Reverend Richard Palwell said, in possibly my favourite quote ever in Theatre of Science, how the study of the sexual system of plants can accord with female modesty, I am not able to comprehend. I have several times seen boys and girls botanising together. <sighs> Nevertheless, Elizabeth sent some sketches over to Han Sloan, and he was very impressed. He said, yep, you're definitely onto something here. You've got a talent. Please write this book. Um, so she ended up 
moving actually to very, very near the Chelsea Physic Garden so that she could more easily draw the plants there. Um, I say more easily, it was incredibly difficult to do. She ended up drawing 500 different plants. Here is the title of the herbal, which is the name for a, a book which is about medicinal plants. I'm not going to say the title, um, but yeah, she had to do loads of drawings. She had to draw them she had to engrave them onto copper plates so that they could be printed. And then she had to hand colour them in, which was usually a job for at least three people. But she wanted to save money because, you know, husband in prison, child to support, 1700s, etc, etc. What's the last plant, by the way? What's the last gorgeous drawing of Elizabeth Blackwell? I'm going to show you. What do you think? It's, yeah, it's a dandelion. Remember, this is a dandelion show. There you go. Look at that. Absolutely stunning very scientific drawing there of the dandelion. Um, so by 1739, the whole thing was finished. Woohoo! And it was released and it was incredibly successful. Elizabeth Blackwell made uh, lots of money. People thought the book was great and very useful. Uh, and she left her husband in jail, actually, moved to Spain and had a great life. Wait, sorry. No, there's something wrong with my notes today. Um, no, sorry. She, she got her husband out of prison. And then he got into more debt and they had to sell the rights to the book. And then he left her to go over to Sweden. That's right. To work as a doctor for the king of Sweden. But that didn't go well because he wasn't a fully trained doctor. So just as Elizabeth Blackwell was going to move to Sweden to start a whole new life with her husband, uh, the king of Sweden chopped her husband's head off. That's right, that's what happened. Um, we don't know what happened to Elizabeth Blackwell after that, except that she died alone. We do know what happened to Hans Sloan, of course. So Hans Sloan's massive collection of awesome stuff. It was very kind of him. He made it that it was very cheap to buy on his death. So he made it that the government could buy it. And that collection of stuff became what is now called the Natural History Museum in London. A wonderful place to walk around and think about being a scientist. You should go and do that. There's nothing stopping you anymore. The end. <laughs> Whew, come back here, you lot. So that's a very scary check, isn't it? <laughs> right, uh, that is, I think that's pretty much the end of the Dandelion Show. I'm going to check my notes because that felt quite, uh, quite, felt quite dense and I might have missed something. But yes, that is basically it. Thank you so much for joining me. I really had fun with this one. I'm never going to look at dandelions the same way again. Um, I have, I threw up very quickly, a post on my Facebook page. So if you're on Facebook and you want to just come over and say hello because you've watched live and you have any questions, then do feel free. I will go to my page now and see if any of you have said anything. Um, I mentioned my magazine. I have to do my ad so that I can make money so that this can keep being my job because it's the best job ever. So how it works is... Everything that I do is free. All my digital content is free. So I do a all ages homemade lesson, which is free. Uh, and this Lego Storytime show and even an IGCF physics lesson. It's all stored on YouTube for free. I even do printouts for the lessons, not this show. Um, and that's all free as well. And how it works is people who can and want to go to this website called Coffee and support me. Uh, if you send me five pounds a month, you can send me more if you like, but five pounds enough from most people is enough to keep me going. That's amazing. So, like, potentially you could watch, like, 12 lessons a month for £5, and I get loads of £5 from loads of people, so it's totally a job. It seems to be working really well. So I am very grateful. Obviously, it's the best job ever, like, obviously, apart from when I eat dandelions. Um, so I will send you nice things to say thank you. I write a theatre science magazine. It comes out about five times a year. You just get it as soon as I've written it. This is the one that I'll send you if you sign up now. It is on mould. Uh, so husband is a graphic designer, which helps. So it's got a comic about mould. Uh, I'll send you a free biodegradable plastic bag so that you can grow your own mould and then identify it using the mould identifier. It's got a choose your own adventure. I'm very proud of Theatre Science Magazine. Thank you to everyone who receives it. I'll also send you some rainbow glasses because they're just fun. I'll send you an explanation of how they work because knowing the explanation is kind of the whole point of the fun. Uh, yes, I will I will be just very grateful. You will be my friend forever. Oh, look, Suki and Arza and Sala and Eunice are here again. Brilliant. Hello, you lot. You're having a science day. Let's see who else is here. Oh, brilliant. You've done a 
dandelion autopsy and you laughed a lot. Oh, you literally did autopsy to the dandelions. Is that dandelions on your head? Nice. Oh, look at that. I'm just, look, I won't show it. Well, I suppose it is public. Can I show it? I think I can. I think if you put it on Facebook, then I can show it on YouTube, right? I'll just show you this head because this is great. Look at this. That is a good lesson, isn't it? <laughs> Splendid. Well done, you lot. Thank you so much for coming. That's really made me smile. <laughs> <laughs> uh, who else is here? Oh, yes, Timothy and Noah and Joseph and Julieta. Hello. Oh, you're making dandelion honey this year. This is definitely what I need. Hello, James and Laura. Hello. Hello, Ty. Hello. I enjoyed it. Kids busy on tech. <laughs> yeah, that's how it goes. Oh, hello, eh? What would happen to the dandelion roots if you tried to grow it in space? That is the kind of thinking that I expect from from theatre of scientists. What would happen to dandelion roots if you tried to grow it in space? Undoubtedly, undoubtedly, someone on the ISS space station has taken plants up to space, haven't they, to see what happens to roots. I, I know I've read about this. I know I have. I think, I think they just still grew down. But why that is, I don't know. I mean, there is gravity acting on the ISS like in, in the spaceship that's going around the Earth, there is gravity pulling it down. It's just like it's always falling. That's why the astronauts float in it. Uh, I'll have to look that up. What happens when plants go in space? Because it's been done. Oh, it's Elijah and Jude. Hello, Elijah and Jude. Hello, Lewis and Isabel and Thomas. Oh, that's brilliant. There's loads of you here. Hello. I've got a bit high pitched. I'm excited. All right, Evie. Heading to YouTube now, says Tony. Good. Hello. Hopefully. Oh, splendid. Oh, there's Samuel. Yeah. Hello, Samuel. Oh, this is great. Elijah, Jude, I'm just scrolling up again. <laughs> Kids busy on tech, fine. All right, you lot, thank you so much for coming. I really appreciate that. I was saying uh, earlier how if I didn't have anyone watching live on YouTube, I would just not do it. Because it's supposed, like, it's useful so that people could come and watch lessons on catch up. But if I came to do it live and there was no one here, I'd be like, oh, I'll just start 20 minutes early. I'll just have another bowl of cereal. And then I would never get anything recorded. And then my job would be over. So I really, really appreciate it. <laughs> okay, oh, there's... Sky, hello Sky and Evie, hello. Looking at dandelions in a different light now. I know, Evie said our dog loves to eat dandelions. Smart dog, calcium, right? Okay, you lot, I'm gonna go. And I think next week's Lego Storytime show might be frogs versus newts. Unless I can think of something more topical. We do need to do frogs versus newts. Yeah, all right, thanks so much for coming. Have a lovely weekend. I will see you soon.